apocalyptic literature then, apocalyptic literature, and I'm sure you covered this in New T. Okay, good. I don't have to do everything. All right. So <laughs> apocalyptic literature means what? What does apocalypse mean? You didn't cover it. Yeah, well, let's start with the basics. What's apocalyptic mean? Apocalypsis is a Greek word, and it means uncovering, unveiling. That's what it means. So apocalyptic means unveiling, revealing, which is why we call the book Revelation. So apocalyptic is an unveiling, and uncovering. It's like kind of lifting the veil, and you take a peek behind it. And so now, what is apocalyptic literature like? This was an entire genre in the time of Jesus. There was a whole genre called apocalyptic literature, and it was rather common, where you would have people taking glimpses into where things are going. And apocalyptic literature is known for lots of figurative language, lots of imagery, lots of numerology kind of stuff going on, kind of code stuff. And if you don't know the code, it looks pretty impressive and pretty off-putting, which is the idea. If you understand what's going on, things start to drop in place. And the basic message of apocalyptic literature is very simple. Things can get really bad. Satan can do some really bad stuff. God's in control. It's going to be all right. It's going to end just the way God wants it to end. That's the bottom line. And if you read Revelation with that in mind, it's not so overwhelming. The other thing with apocalyptic literature is that it's a very much a Semitic way of writing. In other words, a Hebrew way of thinking. And there is a, a real common thing in apocalyptic literature is a sort of spiral approach to telling a story. We've been trained in Greek Western ways of being very linear. Give me the outline. Bang, 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 bang. You know, beginning to end. Progress from introduction to conclusion. Bang. Got it. That's how we do things. The Western, the, East, the Hebrew way was more kind of tell the story one way, then tell the story again from a little different perspective, then tell the story another time from yet another perspective. And that's how, exactly how Revelation reads, incidentally. If, you'll notice that as you read it. If you read Revelation straight through, the world ends about four or five times. You know? And that's why people like Tim LaHaye have such a terrible time trying to figure the whole thing out. Because if they, they try to read it the way we read any other book in a linear way, it doesn't make sense. If you read it kind of recognizing the spiral, things start to make a lot more sense. And you realize it's just telling the story a couple different times and from a different perspective each time. And things are make, it makes a lot more sense that way. We see this even in Genesis. How many creation accounts are there? You've got two. Genesis 1 is giving you the creation account basically from God's perspective. And then Genesis 2 is telling the same story, but from a human perspective. It starts pretty much with the creation of Adam, and everything else kind of gets talked about. But it's not telling two different stories. It's one story with just two different accounts, sort of like two reporters reporting on the same incident. That's what you get. And that's just what you also have going on on Apocalyptic. All the imagery fits in. And the numbers all fit. Things like three being a God's number. Four being the number for the world, the four corners of the world. Seven being the number for perfection. So six is always the number of imperfection. Ten is the number of completeness. So things like the millennium. What is the millennium? Well, it's this thousand-year reign. Well, what is the millennium? It's ten, which is completeness, times ten, which is completeness, times ten. or So it's three tens, God's number. It's completeness, completeness, completeness. Can't get any more complete. That's what a thousand is. Millennium just means Eternity, that's all. Not a big deal. Now, we can spend a lot more time on this, but we really don't need to because you'll be spending a lot more time with this in lots of other classes down the road. The main point at this time to realize is when you're talking eschatology, you're talking about where God's going and what's going to happen. And there is a heaven and there is a hell and there is a judgment day. And judgment day is just another term for the second coming, the last day, God's day, the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. All means the same thing. And so judgment day will come, and what will be the criteria for the judgment? Ultimately, it's going to be, where does a person stand with Christ? That's really an important thing. Are you in Christ or not? The sheep and the goats. But it's also very interesting that Scripture talks frequently about the criteria of judgment will be works. Talks this way all the time. 
read the book of Revelation. It talks, you know, those who have done evil will go to suffering. Those who have done well will come into eternal life. It talks that way a lot. No, talk that way in Revelation. Paul talks that way in his epistles. So how do we understand that? I think we understand it very simply to realize that good works are those that are done by people who are in Christ. Only God's people can do what are truly good works. And so our works are the flowing out of us, but ultimately it's because we are in Christ. That's the only thing that gives us the ability to do what is truly pleasing to God. Same lines. You're talking about, you know, the faith without works was dead. Mm -hmm. You know that if there were no good works as a result of your justification, sanctification, that no you, faith. Would, you would have no faith. Uh huh. Excuse me. And so, I mean, that's 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 really what you're talking yeah, about. That's there. right. That's right. Okay. The Athanasian Creed. I mentioned that the other day. Um, ends with that rather peculiar thing. It says, um, "Those who have done good will go into everlasting life, and those who have done evil to everlasting death." And we say, this is the Catholic faith by which, unless any man believes, he will not be saved. And people think, wow, that's really weird. It sounds like Roman Catholic. I guess it is the Catholic faith. Why are we confessing it? But what the Athanasian Creed is expressing is exactly what the Bible does. That it is, God does look at our works, and he is concerned where we stand before him. A couple years ago, we got into this discussion about levels of heaven. Yeah, uh-huh. Can you enlighten us? Sure. That's all wrong. Sure. Are there levels of heaven? Yes. yes. That's good. But we're in the presence of God. So there you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> but, but there's no need to worry about it because we're in the presence what, of God. Well, we can't say much more about it. I mean, what else is there to say? I don't, I don't know. It just says that there is. So. Sure. St. Paul talks about it, and the indication in the book of Revelation is the idea of kind of greater glory. We know that the levels of heaven or the gr glory given is also a mark of God's grace. And he gives it purely based on his grace and his love, and he'll give it as he sees fit. And if you're looking for it, you're going to miss it. And that's not the point. Your motivation is not, oh, what can I get? And that's, that's kind of that prayer of Jabez thing a little bit, too, you know, the idea of you know, making sure I get a really good place in heaven. And I, I, I want a mansion on the top floor. I want a penthouse, you know. That's crazy. Uh, you're missing the point altogether. You shouldn't be thinking about that. You're busy with this life. And the great story to remember that is that sheep and the goats parable because at the end of the time the Christ comes and he separates the sheep from the goats and he tells the goat the sheep you know walk them into my my eternal life you know walk them into the, the joy of your Lord and they say when do we see you doing all these things and they didn't even know they were doing it they were just doing what they needed to do taking care of people and the goats are thrown out because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing here. So you just simply get busy doing what God's given you to do, and then everything else takes care of itself. That's not that complicated. So you hear people say, we never talk about heaven and about degrees of glory and about the eternal rewards. Yeah, that's right. I don't think we should. There's a reason why we don't. It's not really necessary. It's not appropriate. It's not something we do talk about. Can you find comfort? Um, Luther does talk about when you're in a difficult situation, you're going through difficult ordeals, it's comforting to know that God's got a better plan and things are going to be different. I mean, St. Paul does that too, you know. How do you compare the glory that's to come with the suffering now? You don't. And that's comforting to us. But to um, hold out rewards or glories of heaven or degrees of heaven is somehow the, a motivation is well, always wrong-headed. Okay? Yeah, it does become a works righteous thing, and it becomes a self-centered kind of motivation. That's not appropriate. Todd? That's what I was going to lead to. Is, uh, <coughs> we're here for judgment. <coughs> Where we are with Christ always seems to kind of get glossed over, and people start pointing towards other things. And my example is I've accidentally, or for whatever reasons, read the 40 Days of Purpose. And Rick Warren does an excellent Actually, job of saying, That's exactly hey, where this came up. Excellent job of saying, hey, yeah, Christ did it for you, that's great. But what are you doing with Christ's gifts? Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. And I really had a problem with that. Well, that's not a bad question to ask if you keep it in the right context. If you keep it in the context of your responsibility in this world to be doing the things God has given you to do to your vocation, fine. The, one of the big problems with Warren's book is he does not distinguish between vertical righteousness and horizontal righteousness. And he leads one to believe that your great performance here gets your brownie points with God. And that's not so good and to be nice. Not a good thing. And that's one of the big problems I have with Warren. I mean, his synergistic stuff, yeah, fine, I expect that. No big deal. And 
you know, you, they just, you get this, the can stuff. So he runs down the sacraments, fine, no big surprise there either. But my bigger concern with Warren is he just doesn't get the two kinds of righteousness right. And he, he runs those together, and he ends up running becoming a theologian of glory, which is another topic for another time. Tom? Is uh, the whole idea behind Judgment Day and works, is that, is that this whole concept that, that drives people to despair that they haven't done what they were supposed to? They sure, do because how can supposed? I stand before God? A just judge? I haven't done what I should do. I'm in trouble. That should lead you to despair. And when we're talking about that, is then to try to go off and, and comfort people or, or whatnot that are in despair uh -huh. on their deathbed. And, and uh, I don't know, I just, uh, that's something i got to think about. How's that? Well, it's just, you know, how to deal with that with, with people. You know, I know that's something. Well, no, no, no. What, you, you, what you deal with it is you say, you're right. You're on a louse. You have no business, you know, thinking about God, and you're not going to be able to stand before him. You're right. However. But you're also in Christ, right. and you have his forgiveness. You cling to him. Your performance is, is irrelevant. Right. His performance is what matters. You see, that's, that's the idea of Judgment Day. In 1 Corinthians 5, St. Paul talks about um, we all must stand before the judgment seat of God. And it's a bit of a twist, because most of us have been taught as Lutheran Christians that don't worry about it, Judgment Day is going to be a, a walk in the park, you know, God's just going to confirm his, his love for you, and you'll be in Christ, and it's going to be a cool thing. But the Bible doesn't really say that. At least not... In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul doesn't say it. Paul talks about you're going to appear before the judgment seat of God, and he's going to give an account of your works, your deeds in the flesh. And it also, Paul talks about some of you will be saved as through fire, <laughs> which kind of gives you the impression that, like, by the skin of your teeth, which is also rather sobering. So I tend to think judgment day won't necessarily be an entirely pleasant experience for everybody, but the ultimate end of it will be good news for those in Christ. So in other words, I will stand... I have no idea what will happen, but I envision maybe this kind of idea. You stand before the bar of God and the judgment seat of God, and up on the video, big video screen is your life being played out. All the sordid details. Not an entirely pleasant experience. And what's that? I said in front of everybody. Yeah, that's the point. God, your family, everybody. Like, lovely. This is great. And it's not a good thing. And you see, what, what's the bottom line? I have no claim on your mercy. Nothing. No right to be here. And then Christ steps in and says, yeah, but you're in me, and my forgiveness is yours. Well, that's a good news. Whew, that's great. Cool. Yeah. And so degrees of heaven, give me a break. Just get me in the door, you know, and give me Christ. Give me his forgiveness. And that's, that's what we all cling to. We just we need that. And see, this is what Luther's insight was into all this. Before God, we are always empty-handed beggars, always. And if you ever go walking into God's presence with, hey, look at this big pile of good things I've done. I must be up to level six by now. I'm on my way to seventh heaven here. No chance. Spare me. That is the, that is the stupidest thought. Because we always walk into God with empty pockets, turned inside out. There's nothing to show. We don't have anything worth showing God. We don't have anything that he should say, ooh, that's pretty impressive. There isn't a such thing. Luther's dying words, he wrote them on his bedstead, traditionally is, it is true, we are all beggars. That's it. All beggars. And that's very humbling. You know, who wants to be a homeless beggar? You know, looking for a handout. But that's exactly what you're doing in God's presence. You walk into God, empty hands, looking for a handout. And I throw myself at your mercy. That's all you can do. That's the right picture. So talk of rewards is just, as far as I'm concerned, always out of place. You're talking in God's presence. No business. God in his mercy will choose to do that. That's his mercy, and it's in his court. All I can do is be faithful to what he's called me to do and strive to do that simply because I want to be all that he's created me to be. That's my motivation. Not brownie points, not rewards, not necessarily even always the I love him so much, because that's not always, always, always there the way it should be either. I'm just doing what God's called me to do. And that's what I'm here to do. Okay. All right. Other thoughts? Go ahead, Jeremy. Are we going to talk about Antichrist? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Actually, it was the next time I looked. Okay. So, 
Just, go, just going back on other thoughts. Okay. We, we were going back and we were talking about you know, the resurrection of, of the body and, and the reuniting of body and soul. Um, how then do, do do we deal with discussions regarding things like cremation and oh, excellent question, desecration of body? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's very good. So if we really do believe in a resurrection of the body. And we really believe that a human being is body and soul. What should be our attitude toward that dead body? This is a body that is going to be resurrected. This is a body that was created by God. And actually, the um, rite for the committal service in, the, in our agenda that we use at a funeral, I, if you guys have had the experience of being at a graveside when the pastor does the committal, the, the uh, words are powerful. It's one of the coolest things you get to do as a pastor is this graveside committal. The words are great. There's some really cool prayers in there. But we, uh, the, the actual words of the committal are, now we commit this body to its resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead. And then we have this prayer. May God the Father who created this body, and may God the Son who redeemed this body, and may God the Holy Spirit who sanctified this body, keep it until the day of the resurrection of all flesh. It's awesome. Because what we're doing is we're directing everybody to this body was created by God, redeemed by Christ, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This body, this flesh, was part of the plan of the economia. It's going to live again. And so we have a respect for the body. And like I said, it's that stupidity. That's not grandpa. It's a shell. No, that's grandpa. He's dead now. We're sad, but he's going to live again. And so we have a respect for the body and appreciation. And we should not have a sort of who cares about it sort of attitude. All right? Now, cremation is interesting because cremation, when it started in this country at least, was really driven by the desire to sort of kind of be an in your face to the Christian idea of resurrection. You believe in a resurrection? Fine. Try to resurrect this. That's kind of, that was sort of the attitude. Today, it doesn't really carry that connotation. A lot of people today choose cremation because they think they're saving money. And I encourage you, if you really think that, to do some research and find out. And you might realize that you don't save a whole lot of money. The only way you can really save money with doing a cremation is by doing what they call a direct cremation, which is where you go from the nursing home or the hospital straight to the crematory, and there's no stop anywhere in between. And then you can save some money. But that's not a good thing, in my opinion. Because that's treating the body sort of like it's get rid of it, get it out of the way, be done with it. And it really allows you for the grieving process. Because those who are left behind never have a chance to go and spend time and be with the person who has died. They don't ever see them. And that's lousy for the grieving process. It's becoming popular, and I think it's a really bad thing. A really bad thing. Direct cremation should never be a, a, on our list. If somebody really wants to be cremated, fine. But you better have the chance to have... Uh, some time where you have visitation where people who care and are going to miss that person can have a chance to be there and see that they're really dead and say their goodbyes and have that grieving process. It's important. And I think it's also appropriate to have the body at church where it belongs. This body was baptized into Christ. This body is now, has died in Christ and we have confidence in the resurrection. Funerals belong in churches, Christian funerals. I also really despise this trend I see happening where people are having Christian funerals at funeral homes because it's convenient. Spare me. That is terrible. You know, why should we all, the body of Christ, run down to the local funeral home and look like a bunch of masons having a stupid funeral at a funeral home when we should be having it in the church where Christ baptized his body? That's where it belongs, and they need to be there. Okay, a little venting on that one. Yeah, Carl. So what about organ donating? Organ donation. I don't have a big concern with that. I mean, the what's, you can say, well, whose heart will it be? Oh, God will put everything back where it belongs. And if um, I can help somebody who's still living with parts I don't need anymore, I guess I'm going to have a big ethical problem with that. Now, if you start getting into brain tissue donation, things like that, things are going to get funnier there because then you start wondering about what makes the person the person and that kind of stuff. And things get a little bit you know, dicier, but so far as like um, organ donation, I'm not, I don't have a big concern with that. I don't see a problem there. There is, can be other issues though. Sometimes these get funny because even harvesting some organs gets kind of weird on one person dying and what's going on with death because this is the side you don't hear about. But the reality is that to harvest most organs effectively, the person has to still be living. And they do the harvesting 
while the heart's still going and there's still brain activity, even though that's maybe a flat line brain, you know, kind of thing. But they're harvesting when everything's still running. Yeah, they do. And that gets a little bit funny there, too. And so I, I have concerns there, but that's from another side. Not so much with the resurrection side, but more with the ethical side of what's death and what, how are we treating this body. And seeing again, if you're starting to treat the body like a, um, uh, um, a producer of parts, that's a problem. Because, again, you're not honoring the body. you're ever going to get a tattoo, get your name tattooed on your body, because if you go to the hospital and you become John Doe, you end up at SLU Medical School on a slab. <laughs> or freshmen and sophomore. Uh, and have medical students, students yeah. And medic students and stick needles in your body. Yeah, don't, don't ever donate your body to science. Uh-huh. That's, that's a bad thing to do. You're talking about uh, vicious in the body. Yeah. But I suppose somebody has got to do it. I mean, but not, not a good idea. All right. Um... Antichrist. 